I'm going to introduce this uh, session on the developer power-up, basically going over some of the simple patterns that you need to understand to be able to use Couchbase. Who's already uh, using Couchbase uh, in development today? Great, so half of you. Um, I'm going to introduce a few things about uh, the common patterns that you use to connect to Couchbase and access data. And then Brant's going to take over and talk from a kind of a customer user slash Couchbase expert community and contributor. To, so he's kind of got several hats on and he's going to talk about his development experience and dive in a little deeper than I am on some of the developer side. So on that note, uh, my name is Tyler. I'm a product manager at Couchbase. And I specifically look at the SDK, big data connectors, and full text search. Uh, so you can grab me afterwards or at lunch break if you want to talk about any of these things uh, in a bit more depth. I'm happy to go over it with you. You can email me at tyler at couchbase.com. You'll see slides like this throughout the presentations today, no matter which track you're in. Uh, the we're breaking up our platform into these four or five components, depending on kind of who's talking. And I want to put a big star on the search component there because that's one of our newest service level features that's available in Couchbase. And I'm going to show a really, really quick example of how to connect and use each one of these services here this morning. It's important for you to know that we support these languages officially uh, out of the box. You'll see this list maybe grow in the next year or so with a couple more languages to, to support. But if you see other slides that say other languages on them, they're really not uh, supported languages, as in you're not going to get support from Couchbase support formally uh, on that. But you might still get some help in the forums and in uh, online discussions or emails with the developers that you know at Couchbase. And as we kind of solidify our SDK, um, the way that our SDK operates has been kind of revamped over the last few years. So now all of the SDKs operate almost entirely the same way, same kinds of methods and same kinds of ways of interacting with documents and things like that. So if you are moving from one language to another, you'll find that the paradigm shift is not going to blow your mind, which is a kind of our end goal to make it easy for you to develop on right out of the box. And um, wherever possible, I'm trying to think if there's any exceptions, we use uh, the, the package management utilities that come with these specific languages to install Couchbase. So you rarely will we point you to a uh, download URL that you have to go to when you can actually type in your package management commands or add a, a, a Maven search or whatever into your application and it'll get the libraries for you. And I also just wanted to note that with the 5.0 beta release that we're announcing today, uh, is the best time for you to now go and update your client libraries. There have been improvements uh, across the board for all languages, not just relating to the 5.0 features, but also performance and stability improvements. So if you haven't updated recently, I highly encourage you to do so today. And especially if you want to use some of the new features like the role-based access control, you'll have to upgrade your client libraries to support that to get one that's more recent than than say a month or so ago. In some languages, you need to upgrade for a release that was made even like last week or so. You'll see us kind of move up the stack a little bit too, not just focusing on core language support, but different platforms or different frameworks that can help you get application development happening quicker and easier. If, you haven't, if you're not familiar with how we work with these frameworks, uh, we can talk more about it later. Brant's gonna touch on a little bit of uh, one or two of these. Um, when I talk about patterns that you need for accessing our, the Couchbase services, I kind of view it in uh, four, four different ways. Document access, search access, query, and then analytics. And I'll just go through a few examples. Um, uh, because it's a developer track, I'm allowed to put code samples in my slides. So I uh, apologize if that's uh, not the most enjoyable thing to look at on the screen. But I do have a background graphic in there so that it doesn't feel like it's just code. Um, I want to show, and I show mostly Python examples just because the syntax is usually so much simpler to show here. Now this is a typical way that you connect to a Couchbase bucket. So the bucket has a whole bunch of documents in it, 
and it's kind of the uh, kind of like the namespace or a or a table, and you put in the URL and you used to be able to put in a password for that sp specific bucket. So for those of you that are still in the 4.6 4 paradigm of access control, that's what you've done and that's what you uh, will do until you upgrade to 5.0. And I put the big s sunshine and the heart there because, um, uh, because it's somewhat of a breaking change and I want you to feel happy. Uh, that there's new authentication and role-based access control capabilities in Couchbase 5.0. Um, they're, they're really powerful, they're really good, um, but you need to make some code changes and change your approach to your client application slightly so that you can take advantage of them. Basically, uh, passwordless buckets are gone. Um, you need to create users that have access to all your buckets and use those named users um, and authenticate against those named users and pass that to a specific uh, cluster. So you'll, you'll have a bit more of a paradigm like this. Instead of two lines, you're gonna have four lines uh, and in each language it's, it's slightly different, but you'll see the function names and things are still the same across languages. So that gives you a lot more capabilities for managing um, reading, writing, and administrative um, access to each type of service that Couchbase has. So you can actually get really fine-grained more than before. A typical document, get, and an upsert, uh, that's an insert, uh, or an, uh, kind of a put, but if the document exists already, it'll, it'll uh, upgrade it. That's the, uh, you're gonna find the same uh, syntax across languages. But uh, if you're not already using sub-documents in your applications, this is one way to streamline and re kind of reduce the network u usage uh, across uh, your queries or across your document access where you can actually get just a specific component or path within your document and interact with it, whether it's just getting the value, or setting the value, uh, counter increasing your value. Uh, you can look up just a specific field within your JSON document, or you can change just a field in that document, and it will optimize and do all those changes on the server without pulling the whole document down to the client and then pushing it back to the server. So if you're not already using subdocument, you really probably should be, unless you're needing to pull that whole document down to your client app all the time. Uh, this was uh, 4.5, yeah, that's right. And then uh, 4.6, we introduced data structure support. So this is more like if you want the Couchbase library to kind of manage your document for you, you can just say, I'm gonna create a, a list or a map object, and that's gonna be my document. And you just interact with it using the native programming languages capabilities for lists and collections. Um, the Java collection framework, for example, and the .NET collections are supported so you can do more advanced things than I show here, because those ones take too many more, more lines to put on a slide. But these, this is the, the basic syntax. You specify a document, and you specify, uh, in this case, a, a mapping that I'm adding, where I put name equals Tyler, and, and that does it kind of all behind the scenes. It's actually built on top of sub-document capabilities, so it is optimized for that as well. But you can interact with these like lists and maps and queues where you're pushing things in, popping them off the end. Uh, Sub-document, you can specify a specific path within your JSON that you can access, yeah, by name, yeah. And we'll have more Q&A at the end too, so store up your questions if you've got them. Uh, switching over to the query side, you wanna generate a nickel query, uh, we can generate it fairly easy, pass a full, full query along or a parameterized query. Uh, and this, this is a relatively simplified example here, but you get the idea. And that's um, all I'll really say about the query side. It's, it's straightforward and it works really well. And then search with the sunshine and roses and flying unicorns. Um, the, we're announcing full text search support uh, in 5.0 and our SDKs all support it out of the box, ready to go once you do that upgrade I was telling you to do earlier. And in this case, we do a a basic search for the term hotel. Uh, we do a search within a specific index called hotels, you see in the second line. And you, you define your indexes all through the web admin UI. If you want, you don't have to, you can do it programmatically through REST API as well. And then you interact with it through the SDK 
a uh, fairly simple way. I, I you did a really, really, really basic query here. Otherwise, they do get kind of long um, the more you add into it. If you want to see more examples on the, the full text search or FTS side of things, the, there are um, two sessions happening later today in a different track. I think it's in the operations track. So have a look for those if you want to learn more about them. But you probably just want to stay in this track all day anyway. Uh, a couple more resources for you to go to. Um, until these presentations are online, I recommend going to last year's presentations and looking at the, the videos. There's full video recordings and slides uh, available for that. And then our developer documentation forums and or feel free to contact me directly and I can put you in touch with the right person or uh, to the uh, kind of right forum for discussing these things. And with that, I'll s pass it over to Brant to talk about what they're doing at Center Edge Software. Thanks, Tyler. I appreciate it. Um, so let me start off by uh, telling you a little bit about myself and my company, just to try to give a little bit of context to uh, the stuff I'm going to talk about next. Uh, I'm with Center Edge Software. We've been around for about 13 years, uh, and we specialize in the amusement industry. Uh, so point of sale, group and birthday party bookings, online ticket sales for water parks, amusement parks, family entertainment centers, a lot of trampoline parks, if any of you guys have ever heard of those. They're pretty fun. You get the, uh, the whole floor and the walls are all trampolines, and you go jump around and do backflips and all sorts of fun stuff like that. Uh, so that's kind of been our focus. Uh, and we started off back in 2004, and we were an on-premise application. 2004, that's what you did. We put Microsoft SQL Server, we put it in a box, and we set it on-premise, and we ran our point of sales off of it. Uh, now today, we're more of a hybrid system. Uh, we still need to be on premise because I can't stop taking money for your tickets because my internet connection is down. Most of these places have a cable modem. Uh, however, there's also a significant online portion of the business, selling these tickets online, letting people fill out liability waivers online, book birthday parties online, do online reporting for their managers. Uh, and so to support that, we also have an online presence that we operate ourselves uh, it's not a piece of software we sell to somebody. It's a software as a service solution that integrates with the on-premise application. And so that's kind of where uh, Couchbase started coming in for us. Uh, we first started using Couchbase in 2012 on version 1.8. So we've been using them for quite some time. Uh, that was back before there was any kind of map reduce views, indexes, anything. It was all pure uh, key value document store. Uh, since then, we've expanded the use of it. We're continuing to use new features as they come up. Uh, we've got two different production clusters, a total of uh, 10 nodes. Um, so that's seven nodes in our newer systems and three nodes in our uh, legacy systems from back in 2012. Um, so just to give you a little bit of an idea of what our architecture and data flow looks like, we have synchronization for our on-premise applications as well as our front-end users. All of that flows in through our uh, web services. Uh, and from there is going to flow out into our Couchbase cluster. Uh, we, we do use multidimensional scaling, which allows us to have query nodes that are different than our index nodes, that are different than our data nodes. Uh, and allows us to use different size nodes as well as scale those independently of each other. One thing you will note here, though, is that the only line going into our cluster is into the data. It is possible to use upsert or insert and delete queries running through the query node, more like you're used to with traditional SQL. Uh, however, there's a, there's a performance hit there. I mean, with traditional SQL, if I have to write an update to a database, I gotta sit there and go all the time of turning that into a SQL string. I gotta take that string, I gotta send it to the server. The server's got to parse that, develop a query plan, and then go out and make the change. Uh, and so it makes a lot more sense for speed and performance for these writes if I already know the primary key of the document. Just dump that sucker in there. All I got to do is worry about serializing the JSON. And uh, it helps keep things flowing a little more smoothly. I'm not going to say that there aren't reasons to use the update queries. There are. Um, specifically, if you have some unknown set of documents, you need to make the same change to all of them, then it makes sense. Uh, but for the most part, we try to write straight to the data nodes. Um, so why did we choose Couchbase for our new platform? We started developing on uh, a couple of years ago to replace our legacy stuff. Uh, and there's really three main reasons we chose it. The first is scalability. We are today still in our legacy platform running 21 Microsoft SQL servers in the cloud. That's one, it's expensive. 
And two, every time we need to scale something, it, we're taking things down. I, I got to take that server and I got to shut it down and scale it to a bigger instance in Amazon and bring it back up again. Uh, and there are ways to get around these problems with traditional relational database systems, but they're hard. They're a lot of trouble, and they're more trouble than a shop our size is willing to absorb. Um, but moving to Couchbase has allowed us to get a more robust, scalable system, even though we're a relatively small development shop compared to some of the other Couchbase customers like LinkedIn and Comcast. Um, the second thing is schemaless. Uh, when you're dealing with big data, having a schema, it can actually be a friction point in your development cycle. Um, Whereas if you can just, if, as long as you use good programming practices and enforce the schema on the code side, you don't need the schema in the database. And then of course we were already using Couchbase and we loved it and it had been a great product so we decided to keep moving with it. Um, so that's enough about Center Edge and so now we'll go into some more of these, the, the fun technical stuff. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is finding the right tool for the job. So I, you see I've got a screw and I've got a nut. Uh, and I've got a screwdriver. Now I could probably take that screwdriver and figure out a way to work on that nut. I mean, I'm a developer. I can just about do anything a computer could do. I can make it do that. But the question is, should I? Is it really worth my time to figure out how to turn a nut with a screwdriver when instead I can just get a wrench? It just makes so much more sense. And that is something that we have started to embrace at Center Edge more in terms of microservices. Using microservices allows us to choose different stacks and different tools for the different purposes that we need to develop in the cloud instead of saying it all has to be this way. Now, you don't want to go overboard with this. You know, you don't want some one developer in your shop who happens to love Lisp to go out and try to develop a Lisp based web application and then you've got to support it from now on. But at the same time, you know, giving yourself some more flexibility to choose the tool that's easier and faster and gets this job done has a lot of advantages. And then Couchbase has really helped to support us in that because they have so many of these SDKs that are on these different platforms. So we started off with our monolithic application running on IS7.NET framework running into a Couchbase cluster and it worked great for us. But then last year, .NET Core came out. So now we have some other services that we're running as microservices that are based on .NET Core running in Docker on Linux, if you can believe that. I'm running Microsoft stuff in a Linux box, uh, and it's going into the same Couchbase cluster. Uh, using the same SDK, it's still the .NET SDK, it just has a .NET Core variant of it that is, for all intents and purposes, identical. Uh, and by the way, which I've also experimented and tested to even run it out of Xamarin as well. Uh, so you can do all sorts of fun stuff with it if you really wanted to. Um, but then on top of that, we've also done serverless functions in Amazon uh, based on Node.js, which are reading and writing uh, from the Couchbase cluster. Uh, so that gives us some cases where we got something that might get hit once an hour. It just runs every now and then. I don't need a full service sitting there running all the time. But then I can do this in Node.js, and it's all pretty seamless. I mean, the, the SDKs are different, but if you have the knowledge of the basic constructs like clusters and buckets and queries, it's pretty easy to move between them and between the different uh, languages. So then the next thing that you're going to run into after that is, okay, my, but my team doesn't know NoSQL. And, you know, I've got all these developers, they're, you know, Microsoft SQL or they're Oracle, and they don't know anything about NoSQL. How am I teaching these guys to, to go out and make these microservices that hit Docker? Uh, and it, the answer to that, to me, really, is Nickel. Uh, Nickel is very SQL-like. It's to the point that we actually had a new developer start and gave him a task in Couchbase, and the same day he was writing Nickel queries and moving forward on that task. Uh, does it have some differences? Yes. Probably the single biggest little hiccup that people run into is the fact that you use back ticks as an escape instead of using double quotes like you used to in SQL. The, the team that came up with Nickel had a very good reason for doing that, which is they needed double quotes so they could put JSON in the middle of the query. Uh, but yeah, that's the one thing that tends to trip people up, so when you're, you're teaching your other developers, just make sure to point that out to them. Uh, but it really eases that whole transition. Um, 
But another thing that helps to ease the transition is link to Couchbase. For us, as a .NET shop, this is a big deal to us. And it's why, in full disclaimer here, I'm one of the contributors to this. So I, I, that's why I like to talk about it so much. But it's an excellent example of how, despite the fact that they have these multiple SDK platforms, uh, and they try to keep them similar, they're, they're not creating an artificial limitation with these SDKs and saying they all have to be exactly the same. They allow you to extend upon these SDKs in ways that make sense for the particular language you're working in. Uh, for example, another example is the sub-document API uh, that he had up on the board here earlier that showed you access and sub-documents and gave it a string that gave the path into the sub-document that was where you wanted to go. Well, in .NET, in addition to taking that string, It'll also take a Lambda function that you can have IntelliSense while you're typing, and it'll still drill right down into that subdocument. That's a .NET style extension uh, on top of what is supported across all the SDKs. Uh, now, fair warning, Link to Couchbase is not an official Couchbase product. It is a community project. So if you call their support engineers and say something's not working, they're going to say, what are you talking about? That being said, the support on the forums is excellent and it is curated by Couchbase. So the developers on the .NET SDK team are the ones who are watching this project, curating it, doing the releases of it. So it's sort of a semi-supported uh, system. Um, and what it allows you to do uh, for us is easily write queries. So you can see here that I just write the query in, in link. So with the exception of the fact that I'm using a bucket context, you could think that this was Entity Framework or in Hibernate. I can just go in here and write this query, run it, get the results back out of it, and you'll see below it, that's an example of the actual query that gets generated. Um, now, one of the things that you'll note, though, if you look at that query, is it has where the type equals airline, but if you look at the, uh, the link query above it, it doesn't say anything in there about the type. So type is very commonly used uh, to help differentiate Couchbase documents of different types from each other. It's kind of a a de facto standard that you don't have to follow. You can do what you want, but it's very commonly used for that. Uh, and so there's built-in support for that in Link. So if you'll notice that this is an example of a POCO in Link, and at the very top, you'll see the document type filter. And so by applying this attribute to the document, Link knows to automatically on every query include a where type equals clause. Now, this is extensible, so you can go in and come up with other attributes, filter on other properties, uh, do with it as you will, but this default one is included for you because it's such a common use case. Um, so then, based upon that, then you, there's some things you want to do with your indexes. And then, uh, these, this is, a, in my opinion, are some good indexing practices in general uh, for working with Couchbase if you're using the type attribute, but it fits particularly well with link. Uh, the first is most of your indexes should probably have a where type equals attribute uh, predicate on the index statement. This reduces the size of your index. It's not indexing everything. It's only indexing things with the type of airport and then indexing your source airport column. Now to make this index usable, you have to have that same predicate on your query, but because link is putting in that predicate for us every time we know that it will be able to use this index. Um, sometimes, however, you might have several documents of different types that all happen to have the same attribute. Our example at Center Edge is, you know, we're a multi-tenanted system. So I've got a site ID that represents which tenant it is, and I've got that on just about every single document on the database. So I might want to do an index that indexes site ID across all the types, but when I do that, I'll stick the type attribute as the first attribute in the index. Uh, that way it's able to filter down uh, and jump into that. This just allows me to make one index instead of needing to make an index on site ID for every different document type I have in the system, so it's a little more efficient. But then the third thing is, this is what I consider to be a very important good practice. The, in traditional SQL, when we hit a table and run a query and there's no index, it does a table scan, which is inefficient. If you've got a 10 row table, no big deal. If you've got a 100,000 row table, you've got a problem. Uh, the same is true of Couchbase, except that if you miss your index and it goes back and hits the primary index, it's now scanning your entire bucket not just one table of data. That bucket might have 30 million documents in it easily. Uh, and it all, will almost invariably time out, hit your system performance. Uh, in fact, it's to the point that uh, I understand that there's some people who, as a best practice, don't even create primary indexes on their databases in production so that they can't accidentally hit them. 
but this index is, in my opinion, a good fallback. This is my backstop. If I forgot to make an index, I'll hit this one because every query has a type attribute in the predicate. So therefore, it will fall back and hit this index, which turns it from a full bucket scan into the equivalent of a relational database table scan. So at least it's not as bad as it would have been. Um, another little trick you're going to run into uh, is working with dates and times. JSON doesn't have a specification for how dates and times are supposed to be stored. It's strings, numbers, and booleans, and that's it. Well, and objects and arrays. So how do you go in and how do you read these things? Uh, and the most common answers are going to be ISO 8601 strings, which are very machine readable, sortable, have a time zone on the end of them, or Unix time stamps. Uh, I've heard different shops do it a different way. We use ISO 8601. I've also heard of some people who simply put both in every document. I like ISO 8601 because it's much more human readable. We really love to go in there and use Query Workbench and run queries, and if I get a Unix timestamp, I, I can't read that. <laughs> uh, but if I get an ISO 8601 string, I can read that without having to run it through any kind of converter. Um, the trick is with indexing. So uh, when you are doing an ISO 8601 string, like it shows in this query here, and you're trying to do a range comparison, you have to convert it to milliseconds first, so that it, otherwise it can't account for that time zone on the end of it. Uh, so any kind of range or comparison on those, you always want to convert them to milliseconds first. And this is the standard that the link library uses as well. It makes the assumption that if you have a date time on your object that you're storing it as an ISO 8601 string. Uh, the one tricky but yet neat thing is that if you want to do an index on a column, like this updated column here, you want to actually do the index with string to millis as well. It's one of the great things about Couchbase. I can index on a deterministic function. As long as it's deterministic and as long as it's giving me the same result, I can throw that function in my index. Uh, and it's intelligent enough to know that because I apply that function to my attribute in my query, that that matches the function that was used in the index, and it will use that index for me instead. Um, now, don't go throwing random number generators in the middle of your indexes, because that won't work. It's got to be a deterministic function. Um, and so the end result is that you can write queries in link, like this example here. It's a very complicated query, joins, uh, you can do nest and unnest to get into your interior data. You can do your select projections, skips and takes, which turn into offsets and limits, uh, and get those results back. But then the other advantage is because it's written in link, my query is now code. My query is no longer a big string. When I've got those strings in there and I tell my developers, okay, well, you need to write a test to make sure your query is right, then to run that test, I've got to have a Couchbase cluster up and running that, that query is being run against. Uh, which is not to say you don't need to test like that sometimes, but for fast unit tests, I typically don't want to have to spin up a Couchbase cluster and take all the time to run those tests. When, you know, my unit tests, I want them to be fast and not touch any external dependencies. So this uh, approach allows me to actually inject in, in my unit tests, a mock of my bucket context. I'd have to do some dependency injection tricks here. But then that allows me to actually just have in-memory lists that represent all the documents of the different types. Uh, and inject those in and have that be what's being queried in my unit tests uh, so that I can make sure the query syntax is correct and there's really filtering the data the way I expect it to. So the next thing is querying is nice, but <laughs> I like to change stuff. I mean, querying your data is only half of it. If you don't get the data in there, you're, you're missing your other half. So you got to be able to mutate your data. And so we've all gotten very spoiled. Uh, I, I certainly remember uh, way back in the day that I used to have to deal with, uh, you know, manually building update queries to send in the SQL. And then nowadays we've got Entity Framework. We've got Inhibernate and all these other ORM systems that are just doing the work for us. So we did the same thing with linked Couchbase. So we gave you the change easy button. Uh, and this is similar to what you're going to see in other systems. You ch do change tracking, query the data out, make modifications to your data and then just submit it back. It's going to submit that back. Now, the nice thing here is just like I talked earlier about how that data was going straight into the data nodes and not generating a query and sending it to the query nodes, Link to Couchbase does the same thing. That data is pumped straight back into your data nodes. It's not generating an update query in order to do these updates like any framework or any of those other systems would do. Uh, there is one thing you need to do to support it, which is documents are much bigger in Couchbase than what we're used to dealing with with a, you know, 500 byte row in a table. Uh, the maximum document size in Couchbase, is, unless it's changed, I believe is 20 megabytes. 
Uh, don't do a 20 megabyte document. I've been there. It's not worth it. Don't do it. But you can. <laughs> so the the trick is that o ORMs normally read two copies of the document or the row. They're going to keep one copy that's the original, one copy they give to you so they can compare them to see if they're modified. That's a lot of RAM that you're talking about eating up with a larger couch-based document. So the solution we came up with is we proxy it. So we actually proxy all the properties on your POCO with our copy that when you set and change the property also sets a dirty flag and trickles it all the way up the tree to the root document. So to support that, you have to tweak a couple of things. Your properties need to be virtual so we can override them in the inherited class. Uh, your lists need to be I lists instead of just plain lists so that we can substitute in an observable collection. Uh, and then the other thing is you include the key uh, in the document with the key attributes so that when you insert a new document, we know how to generate the primary key. Um, and so now the last thing, and this is you know jumping off the topic a little bit here, I know, uh, but my big fear when we first started doing this new system a couple of years ago with Couchbase uh, was no transactions. I've been dealing with SQL and relational database systems for my entire career, and I have always had acid transactions. I mean, how do you deal with that as a developer? You know, it's scary, and it scared me. And then eventually, the more I dealt with it, the more I realized I didn't really need them, even though I thought I did. There's some caveats. There's some things you have to do that are a little different. Uh, the first thing is you do get atomicity and you can get isolation and durability out of Couchbase as long as you're writing one document. Uh, by default, all you get is atomicity because they're going for performance. That's where Couchbase aims. Is if there's any question, make it fast. So they aim for performance. You can get the isolation and durability if you request those things and you just have to take the performance hit. Uh, and because it's on a single document, most of the time, I'm only dealing with a single document. Before, when I completed an online order in a web application, I had to write the order header, and I had to write another table of all the line items, another table of all the taxes, another table of uh, credit cards that were involved in the order. I did all these tables, and I needed that to be atomic across all those tables, so I needed an acid transaction. Now, I just write one document. It's the whole order. It's got all that data nested inside of it. So that eliminates a lot of the need uh, for atomic transactions. Uh, but the other thing that really uh, fits well with it is the fact that when we're dealing with microservices, you, it's really, really difficult to give yourself two-phase commits across multiple microservices anyway. You have to have some sort of distributed transaction coordinator, which in turn becomes your single point of failure. There goes your availability. Because if that distributed transaction coordinator goes down, you've got all kinds of problems. And getting it working, I've never even tried because I heard so many horror stories about it. Uh, but my understanding is getting it working is, is not fun. So instead, you just architect your application a little differently. Uh, you just accept the fact that you don't have these two-phase commits in your design. So you write your order to the database initially with a pending status. So then when the credit card gets done processing, it writes another, it writes it back and changes the state to the next status. So that all I need as it passes through these different statuses and sends messages on event buses or uses event sourcing as another great way uh, of writing data. Uh, it helps you avoid the need for these transactions. There's a great presentation. I put a link here. I don't think it has audio. Uh, this one I went to a few months ago in Atlanta. Um, and so you'll be able to get this off the slides when they come up online later. But it's a great presentation about some of the different approaches to dealing uh, with this lack of the two-phase commit across uh, microservice systems. Um, so. The summary of all this is that Couchbase and domain-driven design, which I didn't really talk about that much, and microservices really make a great marriage. Each microservice is a domain. They're all writing to one Couchbase cluster, but then we separate them out so that this microservice is not allowed to touch the data of that other microservice. So I can upgrade them independently and not have to worry about knowing each other's schemas. Anytime you want to get to data, you always talk to the microservice that's responsible for the data. You never skip that line and jump directly down to the couch base, but we can share one cluster to actually have, store that data. But then we can also change that. We can run five clusters if we need to and have some microservices hit this one, some hit that one, but it gives us a lot of flexibility to take each domain and do with it what we need and spread everything out. So that's, that's what I've got. Um, Uh, a few minutes for questions, uh, unless everyone wants to just run straight and get in first in line. Um, you can thank us later. 
Um, just a reminder that we do have the, this mobile app that you can do a survey on. So we'd love to hear your feedback on our sessions. Um, there's also a, a Gartner Peer Insights site you can go to as well. And in case you couldn't find us on social media. Um, are there any questions for, for Brant or I? Yes. So the, the current query planning system is not statistically based in Couchbase. Uh, so it, it doesn't uh, build up a whole bunch of statistics and, and decide which one's optimal. But what it does do is use the one that has the most attributes that match. So because that index only has the one attribute, then the only time it might choose that one over another one would be as if you had a, another index that also only had one attribute that matched with your predicates on your queries. So that's a, that's, that's a good question that I, I'm hoping is going to be addressed very soon in 5.0 because my understanding is that 5.0 has some much better analytics on uh, query performance that I, we're hoping to use. Uh, right now, uh, we don't really have anything great as far as monitoring in place. Uh, we're mostly noticing issues where we have an SLA problem and we go investigate it and discover this result of a query. Other question? Yes. Uh, there will inherently be, yes, a small performance hit because it does have to translate the link expressions into query strings. Um, but I generally find that the slight performance hit there uh, is worth it. Uh, I mean, it's minuscule and it's, and it's a performance hit not on the Couchbase cluster, it's on the consuming client. Um, is it noticeable for you? I, I, we haven't really noticed where it's, it's been an issue at all. Uh, I mean, it's pretty fast. I mean, you got to think we're doing the same sort of processing that Entity Framework is doing, and everybody's using Entity Framework, uh, and it's not really creating a, a big issues. Also, it's a little faster, I think, than Entity Framework. I haven't done comparison performance metrics, but Entity Framework has a lot more stuff to deal with where it has relations between all the documents and how the relations work and how to build that stuff up that linked Couchbase doesn't need to have because you simply have a document that's got all that stuff nested inside of it already. So it doesn't have to look at attributes to see how these two different documents join to each other to be able to, to, uh, to turn it into a hierarchy because it's already naturally a hierarchy. One more question? Um, so you mean like in Node.js in, in Lambda? Uh, the stuff we're doing in Node.js is stuff that uh, doesn't, uh, is typically less complex than the stuff we're doing in .NET. Uh, honestly, if I was doing a really complex Lambda function, I would probably do it in .NET Core because that's an option now in AWS. Uh, the, so it's, it hasn't really been an issue. Um, and Again, it's SQL-like, so having our developers be able to pick up Nickel and write that as a string and use it in a Node.js application is not that hard. It's just not as easy as it is for them to use Link. So, I think we'll we'll call it there. If you want to catch Brant after or I afterwards, you're welcome to.